welcome you to our first of a series of webinars that we'll be doing on LightPoint FSO and millimeter wave technology throughout the year. LightPoint produces a suite of high capacity wireless bridges. Uh, we make a line of 60 and 70, 80 gigahertz band radios, as well as a line of FSO or free space optic wireless bridges, including our all weather hybrid series called Hybridge. Today we're going to talk about the simple good install practices of FSO systems. I want to introduce Brian Peterson with LightPoint Customer Service. Uh, please type your questions throughout the session in the box in the right hand corner, if that's where it is on your screen. And at the end, Brian will answer them. So, Brian, would you please take it away? Good morning or evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our presentation. Uh, today's presentation, as John mentioned, is about hardware installation, specifically about our FSO products. Uh, the goal is to be able to show you really with the proper installation how easy it can be to install LightPoint's products to provide you with years of lasting service. Let me get my slides going. Uh, briefly here, just wanted to give you an idea of LightPoint's history. For those of you who are new to LightPoint, just wanted to give you an idea of when we started and how long we've been doing free space optics uh, products. Really, we started in 1998, so we have a pretty long history of doing free space optics products. Uh, you'll also see that around 2008, we did start doing millimeter wave also as LightPoint and a company called Railwave joined forces. We're going to focus on the free space optics product line, which, as you can see, encompasses these products, the Air Strata Flight Strata product line, the Airlight series, which is a single beam series, and then the Highbridge, which combines either our four beam uh, Strata series product with a integrated backup radio, um, or our Light series with the same type of integrated backup solution. We do, as John mentioned, have millimeter wave systems also, and while they will not be the focus of today's presentation, I uh, did want to make sure everyone is aware that we do have a full suite of high capacity wireless products available to you. And you can see uh, here briefly we have really what we call our air beam product line, which is uh, 60 gigahertz as well as 80 gigahertz products. And that will be part of another presentation that we do, which will be uh, installing millimeter wave products. So we are going to go over free space optics, how to install them, what to look for during the site survey process, how to get things ready to, to install, and then um, showing you examples of installations that have taken place. One of the things that we always want to talk about with light-based products or, or free space optics is the transmission beam. We do use a fairly narrow beam, and as you can see, we talk in terms of millirads. And when you're talking in terms of millirads, what we look at is one degree equals 17.5 millirads. So in our widest beam products, which is our Airlight 100s, um, our Airlight G wide beam products, we have a 5.7 millirad beam divergence. When you translate that into degrees, for those of you who are more familiar doing uh, other RF radio solutions, where maybe you have a 7, 8, 9 degree beam, we have a one-third of a degree beam. So when you then move into our Flight Strata product line, where we have a 2 millirad beam divergence, you're looking at a 0.114 degrees of beam divergence. Now granted, with that type of a narrow beam, we've also incorporated our automatic tracking solution in order to provide you with actually 28 millirads, or about one and a half degrees of capabilities for tracking. If you haven't dealt with free space optics before, we are a strict line of sight product. In other words, if you can't see the other side, you won't be able to transmit there. We do not transmit through trees. Um, we have to have a pure, true line of sight. Now I want to briefly talk about our Strata product line, uh, give you some information about beam tracking 
and why we chose to integrate it into our solutions. As I mentioned, with an extremely narrow beam, we do get increased distances because we've reduced the beam type divergence to allow us to go further, which is a positive. However, the stability requirements then escalate. Well, in order to help compensate for some of those beam movements that take, can take place, specifically with buildings, so as a building heat in, heats and cools, it expands and it contracts. And when a building expands and contracts, it moves a little bit, and it shifts typically in an angular fashion over the course of a day. With the beam tracking, it's not meant to be a high-speed beam tracker. What it's meant to do is compensate for the environmental changes that take place within a building and keep the beams aligned properly. And as I mentioned, we get up to 28 millirads, or 1.5 degrees of movement. And this tracking has been extremely vital for uh, tilt-up buildings, uh, buildings that are made of uh, different types of materials that do expand and contract more than others. To give you an idea of what kind of movement we're talking about, as you look at these images, you can see the small red circles at any given distance, that is the beam's diameter. And as you can see, it's, it's fairly small, relatively speaking. However, when you throw in the tracking mechanism, you can see how much more movement we can tolerate and still keep the units aligned properly. There are different, many, many different ways of uh, installing and situations that our units have been used in. But it really boils down to three different ways that we do our installations. All of them are really in a point-to-point -point fashion, but you might want to take a look at this and say the top one is a standard point-to-point building-to-building solution. The second one would be considered a what we call a point-to-multipoint. Now, if you are familiar with um, radio frequencies where you have maybe an access point and multiple uh, stations located out in the world, we don't actually have the ability to have multiple remote units pointing into a single head unit. We always have to have a one-to-one -one ratio. So as you can see in the middle section, you've got two units on building A and then one each unit on buildings B and C where A would typically be the headquarters and B and C would be the remote locations. Now there are situations where line of sight can be a challenge and there are different ways to overcome this. One of those ways is to use a hop or mid location in order to achieve the connection from building A to building C, in which case building B becomes just that, a hop. Um, you have two units, one pointing to A and one pointing to B, and all it's serving is a purpose to be a hop location. Conversely, you could have a situation where you have building B is maybe um, one building, the buildings are in a row, building A is your headquarters, building B is remote building one, and building C is remote building two, in which case you can go from A to B, put a switch in building B and do a drop off, and then carry on to building C, in which case you actually both extend the distance um, or you can get both buildings connected even though you don't have true line of sight to building C. The last reason to do the back-to-back -back solution is if you actually need to extend the distance. In other words, the product is, say, recommended for one kilometer, and you have a one-and-a-half kilometer shot that you'd like to do and you have a building, building B, that's about midway between the two. Well, you can go from building A to building B, and then from building B to building C, in, which in turn then increases the distance the units are able to go. We also look at it in different ways of how do you want to install it. Because the units are really low powered, they are completely eye safe. You can install them in a variety of different styles and fashions. The most popular is the roof to roof configuration. And in this type of configuration, we need to understand things like distance and angle. 
We also can penetrate windows. And because we can penetrate windows, you can do a window-to-window -window configuration. In this situation, we do have to take into consideration the angle to the glass as well as any potential tinting on the windows, which can both attenuate and reflect the signal. And then, of course, we can do a combination, a window to roof. And when you do this type of configuration, you also need to keep in mind, again, the angle to the glass and any tinting on the windows because, again, of that attenuation or potential reflection. And we talk about angles to the glass. What we talk about is keeping it as close to uh, 90 degrees as possible to the window. This will reduce the amount of refracted and reflected signal strength that's coming in and going out of the units. So the steeper the angle you're trying to shoot at, the more difficulty you're going to have. The closer you can stay to 90 degrees to the window, the better off you will be. Now, FSO is a light-based, laser-based solution, which means it is based purely on the line of sight and the amount of attenuation that's in the air or in the line between the two units can affect the signal strength and can affect the quality of your installation. So things that you need to look at, and we do recommend that you do a physical site survey. Um, we here also use things like Google Earth, which helps us kind of get an idea of the distance between the two buildings. If you know that the um, the two GPS coordinates or the two addresses, Google Earth is a great way to kind of try and look at the path. What Google Earth doesn't do a lot, uh, doesn't do a very good job of is being able to see trees, smokestacks, uh, potential vapor from um, air conditionings or heating sources during the winter time. Smoke, steam, these can create attenuation and you want to try and not shoot through the steam or the smoke. Additionally, you want to take a look at the angle that you're shooting at. Now, these units are point-to-point -point units, so no matter how you rotate them, as long as they can see each other, they will work. However, there are things you need to be aware of. For instance, the unit that might be pointing up at a greater than 35 degree angle can get pooling of water on the faceplate. That pooling of the water will eventually attenuate the signal and cause the signal to kind of shift as it tries to pass through the water. Additionally, tilting them up at an extreme angle will allow the sun to hit the faceplate again of that unit pointing up. What that does is it sends the unit into an overload situation and can cause packet losses. So you really want to try and minimize your uh, angles to about a 35 degree angle. The other thing that you should be aware of is when you're shooting across long stretches of roof at a very low um, height, you will get what's called heat shimmer or scintillation, as you can see on the image on the right-hand side. Heat shimmer can distort the signal as it's passing through. Normally, if you raise the unit up, that will mitigate any issues that you're having with the scintillation. And while these appear to be silly, they do occur uh, frequently because our units, once installed, can go, you know, five, seven, ten years um, reliably. Well, that's great news. However, if you planted it, if you installed it where a tree was small, over the course of those five or ten years, the tree will grow. So the first thing to always check if you're seeing problems, especially on a unit that's been running reliably for a number of years, is to go up and do a physical check. Has something changed? Has that tree grown? Has uh, the leaves come on and you installed that it was winter time and there were no leaves on the trees? Those types of things do occur. They're easy to check and then um, easy to fix. Same type of idea. Let's say you installed your unit a couple of years ago. Everything seems to be fine and then all of a sudden you're seeing some intermittent outages. Well, if you happen to go up on the roof and see cranes or other construction materials passing through the center or someone is building a building in between your two locations, 
that crane passing through the line of sight with its construction materials will cause brief outages. It doesn't affect the quality of the unit, but it does affect the quality of the signal being received by your switches. And of course, a Cisco switch that receives too many um, what they would call flapping incidents will shut the port down. So it is important that you investigate and see if there's anything like uh, cranes or window washers affecting your signal. On the same type of an idea, we do have customers where we recommend that everything be installed at the edge of the roof. This avoids people walking in front of the unit and accidentally blocking the unit. However, we do have the understanding that there are aesthetic reasons or building codes that require units not be placed at this, the edge of the units because it's a historic building, because it's in an area that they're trying to preserve visually, in which case you need to set the unit further back. Well, if you opt to do that or you're required to do that, just keep in mind you need to raise that unit high enough so that when people are on the roof working, uh, doing air conditioning maintenance, etc., that they're not able to walk in front of the unit and accidentally block the beam. So depending on the unit that you purchase, you will have different power supply available. All of our products, I would say at this point about 80% of the systems that we're selling are within the AIR product line. AIR Strata, Hybrid SX, AIR Beam, AIR Light Gs, AIR Light 100s, all of these are now PoE products and we use a high-powered PoE for those products, in which case you need to run two sets of cables, one Cat5 for the power, and then a Cat5e or Cat6 cable for the data. Of course, you can run Cat6 for the PoE also if it's easier to run two of the same style cables, uh, perfectly acceptable. If you are purchasing or you already have a Flight Strata product, you'll uh, know that that uses an AC power supply that needs to be near the roof, near the unit's installation location and those units use a 12 volt DC input power. And then all of our products have a DC power option, meaning if you have 48 volt DC at the location and you would prefer to use 48 volt, we do have the option of either running direct 48 volt on some units or using a converter. So. Uh, keep in mind your building codes, the situation you're in, and uh, what cabling you might need. Now we do offer the option on a lot of our products to do fiber as opposed to doing copper. Uh, for instance, on our air product categories, we have two ports. We have an SFP port, which can be fiber, or we have a 10, 100, 1000 copper port. So if you choose to go fiber because your distance is too long and you can't, you're exceeding the IEEE standard for copper, by all means uh, fiber is available on our units. What you can do then is make sure that you're running the right kind of fiber for your situation, single mode, multi-mode. If it's going to be outdoors, you want to make sure you're using the proper kind of fiber or putting it in a conduit. And then depending on the unit, Again, all of our air-based products use LC connectors at the unit's end, and our older Flight Strata product lines use SC connectors, Sam Charlie. We do run into a lot of issues with fiber, uh, cracked fiber, connectors poorly terminated, or cracking at the connectors, in which case we always recommend that you run a couple extra strands if possible so that you have them available should a situation occur. Copper wires, um, this has become the most popular method for providing data to our units. Uh, since we moved to this type of solution uh, a couple of years ago, we've seen almost all of our products go out with the copper as the preferred method of connection. And I think that has more to do with the fact that copper is easier to deal with, easier to run, easier to terminate, but you do have the challenge of you need to keep your, your cable lengths at 100 meters from 
the unit's end to your switch end. So talking about the mounting requirements, so what we have are looking at the location, what type of mount, and then how we're going to do this. So I'm showing you here images of various installations in various locations, and all of these are successful installations. Many of them use custom components and custom designs in order to meet the specifics of their application. So we've already talked about clear line of sight. Part two is a stable surface. In other words, if you're on a building that is bouncy and spongy, then it's going to potentially have some movement to it. Do you have ability to get your power and your fiber to the correct location? And we do talk about things like safe location for installation and easy access for maintenance. Those two kind of go hand in hand. We do recommend that if you have the ability to install in a location that does not require a cherry picker or a scissor lift or some other piece of heavy equipment to get to it, to choose that type of a location. And the reason being is if we do recommend every, oh, about six months or so going up and inspecting the units. These are outdoor units. They're in an outdoor environment. They're exposed to all of the elements. Inspecting them uh, twice a year is a nice way to check on them, make sure that they still have good signal strength, make sure that the birds aren't affecting them, uh, nothing is eating away at anything else, etc. And so if you have this installed in a location that requires heavy machinery to get to it, it obviously makes it a little bit more difficult and therefore the maintenance will not necessarily be taken care of as often as it should. So there's different ways of doing um, mounts. There's penetrating, drilling in and bolting to the actual location, or non-penetrating, where you actually have a sled on top of the roof. You want to make sure you do have the roof access. You want to make sure you understand how high you're going to be installing, and that you make sure that you compensate with the proper type of mount to avoid it flexing and moving we will not operate well on what's called a whip antenna or a thin-based antenna. Again, our narrow beam can't tolerate the movements that a uh, small, uh, small tube would provide. And then, of course, we want to look at if there's a surface angle involved. So what works best for us? Again, stability. When you talk about stability, we talk about reinforced concrete. We talk about poured concrete. We talk about good brick structures, steel beams, possibly even an existing large diameter pole that's already on the roof, possibly for a microwave installation. Problem surfaces are things that end up moving, flexing, or changing with the weather conditions. Wood. Wood, when it expands and contracts with water. Not a good choice. Fiberglass flexes. Sheet metal is probably one of um, the worst. We see a lot of countries where sheet metal is the preferred method for doing construction, whether it's for the sides of the buildings or for the roof. Uh, typically, it's called a corrugated steel. Um, very stable for the building itself in terms of it being um, a secure environment to work in. However, that metal will expand and twist and torque as it heats and cools. And not only does it just move kind of side to side, it can actually twist and bend as it heats and expands and cools and contracts. Not a good surface for us. The top image here, actually both images, show you what we consider to be our standard universal mount. This mount is included in the system pricing. And as you can see, it can be used to be mounted in a vertical or horizontal position, depending on what's needed. And the mount, uh, the link head would mount either on the top or to the side of the unit. Really depends on what you're going to do. Now, what I'll show you as we go on is how people have used this particular mount or components of it for their own specific applications. So here are some um, outdoor 
style non-penetrating roof mounts. Uh, I've tried to put a couple of the web sites that sell these so that if you wanted to go do some research on them you can. Um, but basically what these do is these sit on top of the roof. They don't penetrate, which if you don't own the building, uh, and even if you do, might be the preferred method of installation so that you don't void any, any warranties or any um, roofing um, water penetration. Again, in these you see some applications where portions of the universal mount are being used. Um, the upper left hand one, you can see they use the pole and the cap, but not the base plate. And then they use a hanger or brackets available readily from other manufacturers to hang the pole off, hang our unit off of an existing pole. And once again, you can see um, on the left-hand side, a customer used our standard universal mount in a horizontal fashion. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see, again, they used portions of our um, universal mount with a readily available local non-penetrating roof mount. Again, even in, in certain cases, they didn't use any of our mount. They strictly used Unistrut to mount, and I'm referring to the picture on the left-hand side, to mount the pan and tilt directly to an existing steel girder. They, of course, uh, as I mentioned here, used bird spikes to prevent birds from roosting or landing on the units. The other two, again, continue on showing various non-penetrating uh, customer installations. And here is probably one of the best images I've ever received from a customer in Florida. And what they needed to do was, of course, achieve extremely high elevation, but putting a pole that tall, unsupported, would have been death the unit would have been moving and waving in the winds. And so the recommendation was to guy it down. In other words, create a strong pole, even though it's tall, that won't move in the wind. And they've done a textbook installation. Uh, this installation's been up for over five years. Um, and has operated flawlessly throughout all of the different weather conditions that have affected Florida. Can we go on a monopole? Yes, but you do need to take precautions. You need to use a strata product which has tracking mechanism. You need to mount as low on the pole as possible. You need to make sure you use the proper types of mounts to attach to the monopole. And here I've also uh, tried to include, again, some web addresses to locate these different components that are used. Once again, you have a flight strata product um, attached to a handrail. Here they used, again, the pole and the cap attaching to an existing 4.5 inch OD pipe. Here they used the cap attached to a 2 and 7 eighths inch OD pipe um, with brackets attaching to the existing concrete building. So here's some key guidelines and this is a good takeaway. If you're thinking about installing and where you're going to install, these are the things to look at. If you're going to have to go higher than 2 meters unsupported, you need to have a 4.5 inch or 114 millimeter OD pipe in order to keep the stability. Again, you've got basically this two, you know, 6, 8, 10 feet in the air air strata product that weighs almost 30 pounds with the pan and tilt. When the wind blows, if that pipe isn't sturdy enough to hold that unit, it's going to move and wave in the wind. And that will cause you problems because, as I mentioned, we implore, we, we use a low-speed tracking mechanism, not a high-speed tracking mechanism. So the keys here are on, in purple. Uh, the non-penetrating roof mounts 
are really only as rigid as the roof they're sitting under. Um, recently I've had a couple of installations where the roof itself was spongy. So even though they used a quality non-penetrating roof mount, when the gentleman was doing the alignment, his weight was pressing down on the roof and the roof was flexing. When he stepped away from the mount, the roof basically sprung back up and took the unit out of alignment. Created a bit of a tricky installation solution where he had to kind of figure out how much his weight was affecting the signal strength. The other thing we want to take a look at is the angle of deflection, I'll read it for you, of a monopolar tower is proportional to the square of the mounted height. The bottom line is mount as low as possible on a tower or pole or monopole as you can. The lower you are, the more stable it is, the less movement you will experience. On buildings, especially those that are not going to be using a tracking product, the best place to be is the corner. You will have the most, the greatest amount of stability when you get to the corners of a building. So, whenever possible, get to the corners. If you have to, do whatever you can to get there. You will be happier with the results of your installation if you do. These are fairly, should be self-evident. If you're drilling into the brick and it's just crumbling as you're drilling, that's not going to be a good installation. Veneers, um, which is some, are used a lot, especially in California, where they want it to look pretty. But the problem is they're really not part of the structure. They're there just for the looks. And those materials will flex and they will move, and they're not intended to necessarily hold 35 or 40 pounds of weight along with wind loading. We've talked about sheet metal and plasterboard. Again, holding that weight is going to be rather difficult. So we've talked about mounting indoors. Um, a couple other things that do come up frequently with indoor mounting are questions about safety. Uh, the units are 100% safe. We go through EMI testing, um, and they are safe for electric um, for for the EMI. We also are eye safe, so you don't have to worry about anybody possibly having looking at them. They can look at them as much as they want with the naked eye without a problem. Uh, but you do have to keep in mind coatings or tinted glass and double pane insulated windows. They can cause extreme amounts of attenuation and the signal strength, even at close distances, can be very difficult to get. So what um, that pretty much wraps it up. I really wanted to try and keep it in that 30-minute range for everyone. So if there's any questions, um, please let me know. And um, if you need anything else, please feel free to contact me directly. Um, you can also see many, many more of our installations at YouTube at Lightpoint Wireless. So, uh, John, if you're there, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, yeah, if you, uh, if everyone, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, uh, type it out there on the, the little window box that you have uh, with the webinar series. Um, and just wanted to uh, let everybody know that if you know someone that uh, missed this webinar, if you think might be interested in getting this, uh, we're actually going to repeat this probably in two weeks, uh, probably around uh, later in the day, to catch different time zones, uh, be probably around the 27th uh, of uh, February. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll send out a notice on that so that you can let it, let, you know, uh, your, your proper people to see that. Um, one question came in from uh, Tom. Uh, his question is uh, concerned about uh, visibility, uh, fog issues, that sort of thing. Brian, can you address that? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, fog, fog is always um, something to keep in mind because it is something that will affect the line of sight. Now, the units will be able to penetrate a certain amount of fog. Uh, but we also have developed the Highbridge product line, which, again, uses a 5.8 gigahertz. Now, you can also use your own radio if you wish to, but um, basically our integrated Highbridge SXR 
5 and LXR5 uh, use a backup radio, which will then, when the FSO is affected by fog, will fail over to that to provide you with um, continued connectivity until the fog lifts. But um, we do have some calculators that we use, so if you know the distance, we can plug in some numbers about fog and give you an idea of what would be the best product. Um, and then we, of course, have the hybrid solution to um, really eliminate any worries that you um, or your end customer may have regarding the product and fog. Great. Uh, we've got a question from Rob. Will uh, you email attendees a copy of this presentation? But I think you've got this in a PDF, right? You might be able to send out if they send a request. Yes. Yeah. If they send me a request, I will be more than happy to um, to send them a copy of it. And then um, we're going to be doing a recording of this, and then we will also put that into the support section um, in the future. Right. And, and by the way, if you don't have uh, membership into our uh, support section on our webinar, uh, please send uh, Brian or myself a request, and uh, we can get your password into it. Um, let's see. Is there a temporary situation uh, that we can use a tripod? That's from Rick. Um, there are situations where a tripod is useful. Um, the tripods that we have used in the past um, will work fairly well um, for mild weather conditions, um, but we haven't really tested one that's meant to withstand, say, heavy weather conditions. You would be much better off to get a, uh, one of those non-penetrating uh, mounts and installing that as a temporary solution. They are, as I said, they're, they're, they bolt together and then they come apart. Um, and so while we, we do have a disaster recovery kit that uses a tripod, um, it would be something that would be used for um, really short periods of time and not something that's, when we, some people say temporary, they mean two to three months. Are talking about like our disaster recovery kit. We're talking about a couple of days. Um, so, does that answer the question? I guess. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, uh, let's see if there's any more questions. I, I think we've covered them all. Some of them were a little repetitive. Um, and uh, okay, I, I think that's it. Brian, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank.